In homework 10.1, we are looking at whether a sample could have a population mean that is an already known value. In 10.1, we're looking at data on how far paper aircraft have been thrown from the uh, porch of the A building on the Palaker campus. In the image on the screen, you can see Katrika ready to throw her aircraft. If we look, scroll down a bit, there's Stania throwing hers. This is from the second floor balcony. And the airplanes then land out on the lawn uh, away from the uh, classroom. And I'll go down with a tape measure and measure how far away from the building the airplanes traveled. And that will yield the data for the sample. So what you have on the left is 42 aircraft flown from that porch in the spring of 2020. Uh, 42 different aircraft by 42 different students. A distance of zero would mean that the airplane fell straight down like a rock. These negative values mean that the airplane circled back and landed underneath us on the porch. So they actually landed behind where they started. And the rest of these positive numbers are airplanes that flew out with the farthest distance being 1,320 centimeters, 13 some meters, out around 20 feet from the building or so. So the question is, could this uh, sample have a population mean of 560? And one of the questions I know students have is, why 560? Because I've measured all of the aircraft thrown from the porch since 2012 and kept track of the running population mean distance. On average, over the last eight years, over 800 some aircraft have flown 560 centimeters as an average, population average. So this is a rigged example in that I know what the population mean is. And were we to have done this in the fall, this fall, we would have thrown the airplanes again, and we would have run it against that 560 number. But we didn't, and so we're using the spring data. But that's where the 560 comes from. This is rigged in the sense that I know that over the long haul, the average is 560. Well, let's go ahead and start this one. I'll start with the count. I'll have to click on the ABC button. Get over to the count. Once I see it up here, I can use that. That's the one I want. I'm going to go ahead and type it in. Be a little bit easier than dragging because that drag will take me off screen anyway. Press the check mark and there's 42, 42 aircraft. That's what I expect. That's what I should see. Now, on average, how far did these airplanes fly? Now, I'm expecting 560 because for hundreds of aircraft, if you take the average distance, you get 560. So, I... In my statistical brain, I'm thinking it should be 560. And if I make that calculation, I see 441. That's about 120 centimeters less than I, uh, than I actually thought I'd see. That raises a question as to whether these aircraft potentially underperformed the historic norms, whether they, these aircraft simply cannot fly as far as the aircrafts from previous terms. It raises the question of have students lost the ability to build aircraft that fly or that fly as good as they used to. But the problem is, if you look at the numbers, these planes flew everything from negative 200 to 1320. There is a vast range of values here. And so if I took these same 42 airplanes and threw them again, I would not get 441. I don't know what I'd get, but you can be certain it wouldn't be 441.1904762. Although I do not know what the sample mean would be, I've got 42 aircraft. They can be treated as behaving randomly if thrown over and over and over again, and as such, it means that their sample means should distribute normally around whatever their actual population mean is. Put another way, this 441 
comes from a normal distribution of sample means for all the possible throws of these aircraft, even though I only threw them once. Now, my point estimate of the population mean has to be that 441. That's what I'm estimating it is. Don't confuse that with the known. This is a rigged example where I happen to know, but most of the time we don't know the population mean. And so we, we, uh, we're left with that as our best estimate of what the population mean might be. Calculating the sample standard deviation. Well, let me see what kind of... I want this one, standard deviation. Don't get fancy. Don't pull one of those other functions we don't use. That will tell me the kind of spread there is in the data. That's a lot of spread. On average, these aircraft are 337 centimeters away from 441. Now I'm going to calculate the spread in the standard, in the sample mean. The sample standard error of the mean is the spread in the means if I threw these airplanes many more times and calculated many more means. So that value, be careful typing this in. I have to be careful myself. I want to take the standard deviation, which is the spread in the data, and I'm going to reduce that spread by the square root of the sample size. Right there. That tells me that even if I throw these airplanes over and over again, that standard deviation of the sample means, this is of multiple sample means, the standard deviation of the sample means, which we call the standard error, it's going to be 52. I'm going to use the t-critical. Again, I should be careful in here. Equals the t-inverse right there. The probability. The probability is the probability... Let me put it simply. We're talking about the probability that you will be wrong. That's not right, and statisticians would get upset with me. think, well, that's not what it really is, but... We're going to treat it as the probability that you are wrong or how likely you want to be wrong. We, we use a rate of error of 5%. There are two ways to get there. In chapter 9.2, we used 1 minus 0 0.95. And that's certainly one way to get to a 5% error. That's 1 minus C. In this chapter, we talk about the probability as being alpha. Alpha is our risk of a type 1 error. This is the same thing as 1 minus 0 0.95. Look, a dollar minus 95 cents is a nickel. If I tell you that someone gave me 95 cents less than a dollar, you know I got a nickel. So 1 minus 95 cents is a nickel, and that's a nickel. 0 0.05 is a nickel. A type 1 error is a probability that I will have uh, rejected the null hypothesis when I I shouldn't have rejected it, when it was not the uh, decision to be made. So 5% of the time, I'm going to reject when I shouldn't. Basically, at some level, it means over the long haul, 95% of the time, I should be correct. The back of this is also important. Lots of mistakes often made here. This is the degrees of freedom. This is a subtle thing to explain, and I don't think I'll try to explain it in this homework solution, but it is just a sample size minus one. It, it relates to the fact that in a sample, we just don't have as much information as we do in a population. Um, we have, and so it, it, it's the degrees of freedom available in a system, but I'll set that aside. For now, it's n minus 1. Some students mistakenly use the mean, not the mean. It's n minus 1, the 42 minus 1, or 41. One of the things I'm going to look for is, when I'm running with a 95% confidence interval, and I'm talking about a sample size of 30 or more, I'm going to see numbers somewhere just above 2 here. It won't be exactly 2. Uh, and if the number gets really big, like a sample size of 500, I might see a number slightly under 2. It can go down as low as 1.96 when my sample size is infinite. But who's going to make a measurement of an infinite sample size? Now, 
I'm calculating the range in which I expect the sample means could be found. 95% of the time, if I kept throwing those airplanes over and over and over and over again. Well, I'm going to take the mean minus T critical times the standard error. Not the standard deviation. That would tell me the spread of the data, the 95% confidence interval for the data. I'm calculating the 95% confidence interval for the sample mean. So, I do not expect to see sample means less than 336. That's what that just told me. Upper bound, the mean, plus, find a plus sign. Plus, what was up here? Ha! Plus, the T critical. Be careful. Don't fill down. It won't work. I saw someone fill down. It's like, no, it won't work. Get out of there. T critical times the standard error. This thing, the D7 times D6, actually has a name. We call it the margin of error. I don't use that much anymore because people get confused between the standard error and the margin of error. There's too many errors running around. Press check. 546. The upper bound for the 95% confidence interval is 546 centimeters. These two numbers right here are telling me an awful lot. They're telling me that even if I take all 42 airplanes right now, go up to the porch and throw them off again, I can be 95% confident that the mean will land between 336 and 546. It's not going to land above 546. I'm not going to get a mean less than 336. The risk that that will happen is about a 5% risk that that will happen. At some level, one has to be willing to be wrong. You can never get 100%. You might think, well, Leeling, I don't want to be wrong 5% of the time. I want to be wrong none of the time. I want to be 100% correct. You could try. You go back to your T critical and say, I don't want any error at all. I want just no error. You try it. See what you get. Num, num, num. Num is an error. The normal curve goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. That means that you're asking for a range that goes from negative infinity to positive infinity. It has no meaning. Now, the normal curve is underneath all random variation. That means you can never be 100% certain of being correct. You can't be 100% right. You can't be perfect. And random variation is exhibited by any sufficiently complex system. So long after you finish statistics, there's an important lesson to be learned here. You can't be perfect. I am not perfect. You are not perfect. And the math tells us nothing that varies randomly can ever be perfect. In that sense of being 100% correct on every single uh, uh, hypothesis test that you ever run. Well, does it include the, uh, does the 95% confidence in include expected population mean? No, it does not. Is the expected population possible? No, it's not. No, it's not. This is not a uh, possible population mean. We, 95% uh, is good enough for this type of study. Now, if we were designing a medicine to cure, say, heart attacks, we'd probably want to be more than 95% certain that the medicine actually worked. So some fields do use higher levels of confidence and lower alphas, back here, lower alphas, some go all the way down to, say, you can go down to point 0.1, and you might note that this just went past, so at, at point one, I can no longer be 99% confident. I can be 95%, but not 99% confident. So that's a little, that may, that should bother you. But welcome to the wonderful world of statistics. We generally tend to stick to a 95% confidence interval. Because as you step up to higher levels of confidence, as you see here, 
you increase the risk that you will fail to reject the null hypothesis when you should. The book covers this. It's a type 2 error, and it's a, it's a case where you should have rejected the null hypothesis, and you failed to reject it. Uh, your risk really goes up very quickly after you leave the world of a uh, 95% confidence interval. So the answer does depend on your willingness to accept risk. But for this particular homework where you've been told to go ahead and use the 95% confidence interval, a 5% alpha, a 5% risk of a type 1 error, uh, the... Uh, you uh, um, you cannot uh, you well, I'll use the words coming up in the next chapter. We will reject the null hypothesis that the population mean is five sixty. Now, could we be wrong? Yes. What's our risk of being wrong? Somewhere on the order of a five percent risk, but that's a bit chancy to say because ultimately, the in the we are either right or wrong, and we'll never know which. All we'll know is that if we keep running these tests at 95% levels of confidence, we'll get them wrong 5% of the time. Here I've rejected a null hypothesis. If I have rejected a null hypothesis that I should not have rejected, as type 1 error, uh, then I've committed a type 1 error. And that, that risk, as I say, about 5%. It's kind of complicated to talk about it and think about it. I like to think in terms of the confidence interval. What this tells me is these aircraft that were flown from the porch on that particular day tend to fly between 437 and 400 and, sorry, 546. That that's the range in which those aircraft are usually found, between 437 and 546. And 560 is not within that range. And so we do not expect this these aircraft to ever produce an average that high. That means that these aircraft are probably not as uh, good at flying as those thrown by the, the, the predecessors. There's a lot of confounding variables, but this suggests that the aircraft that were flown in spring 2020 were not as good at flying as those put together by their predecessors. So that's a that's 10.1. I know that's a long explanation, but these are complicated problems. And they are at the core of the most important material of the course. We are now able to say whether or not a sample comes from a particular population based on the averages. That is, we can say whether or not the average seen in a sample represents that seen in a broader population. We do have to have some comparison value, but we often have those. Most experiments aren't being done for the very first time, so we often have an expected or predicted value that we can run an experiment against to see if we get that result. So do take a look at these. Of course, you can always look at the book. Um, the book uh, book includes the information on this material. Uh, hypothesis testing, case one, case two. The sample comes from the population. In this particular homework, we had case two. The sample does not come from that population. The population mean is not a possible population mean for the sample. The book takes you through another example and talks about this and then moves on into um, hypothesis testing where I introduce the language that I've just used, the idea of a type 1 error. We failed to, um, uh, we rejected the null hypothesis as false. We did that today. Our risk is a type 1 error. If we, we, that's what we just did in this homework. We rejected a null hypothesis that the planes fly 560 centimeters. Our risk that we are wrong is uh, a type 1 error risk of 5%. We, if, if, and if the null hypothesis is actually true, we've made a mistake.
you'll see this uh, section coming up will refer to a type 1 error as a false positive and a type 2 error as a false negative and you'll see some other things in that as you read ahead into section 10.2 and get ready to do the homework in 10.2 the homework in 10.2 and 10.3 is directly related to 10.1 it's the same class of problems hypothesis tests we use the confidence interval to test it the next two sections will soon simply show you two other techniques to do the exact same thing different techniques to do the same thing to test hypotheses and so that's another place where this gets confusing a lot of language a lot of kind of philosophical underpinnings to it along with math but that's the world of statistics so that should get you through 10.1 if you've stayed with this video and should help you work it out it also I hope will give you some idea of how to think about the results you get from it